I'm going to call the Springfield City Council work session to order with roll call. Mayor Van Gordon. Here. Councillor Pitts. Councillor Moe. Here. Councillor Rodley. Here. Councillor Stair. Here. Councillor Woodrow and Councillor Pishinary. Here. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Woodrow is excused for the evening and we are expecting Councillor Pitts here soon. We have one item for the work session tonight, uh, not emergency medical transport with Chief Caven. Mayor, Council, thanks for having me. I'm happy to update you guys tonight, talk a little bit about uh, the non-emergency transport contract we have with Mid-Valley Ambulance. What's going on with that? A little bit of background of, of other ambulance work. We're um, working on between our two cities and uh, just kind of looking for, for feedback from the Council on our, our recommendations. So um, without further delay, I'll kind of get into the presentation here. Yep. No worries. Uh-oh. We could email you a fresh copy if Digital world. I guess, Chief, you're just going to have to describe them. They're, they're pretty easy. <laughs> I've, I've got a copy to run off of, but. It's not as exciting without the colorful graphics that you can get in PowerPoint. Copy and well, while we're working on the technology in an interest of your time and to give Plenty of time for questions and comments. I'll start to go through the slides manually if that works for you all. Okay. Um, so Mid Valley Ambulance uh, gave us notice of an intent not to renew their contract for providing non-emergency transport within the cities of Eugene and Springfield at the end of FY23. Their current contract expires June 30th of 2023 uh, with the option to uh, extend one more year before we have to go out for a formal RFP process. Uh, Mid-Valley Ambulance provides contract non-emergency transport services, including uh, transports from care facilities, urgent care transports, hospital to hospital transports, and out of area transports, among other uh, suites of private business that they conduct within our area um, that include a robust wheelchair and stretcher car service for those non-medically uh, necessary transports that occur. Hang on one second, Chief. Uh, Councillor Pitts just texted the up oh, there he is. All right, well, keep going. Okay, so that's a little bit about their their business. They've been with us uh, in in the region, or we've contracted this work uh, since two thousand and eight within the city of Eugene and two thousand and ten uh, within the city of Springfield. Uh, Mid Valley began to reduce their services that they're not contracted to provide on behalf of the cities. Uh, that included wheelchair and transport services. So, oh, here we are. I'll pause just momentarily. Or 
I'll keep going. We'll catch up. Um, so they began to actually reduce those physical services that aren't contracted uh, as of November 4th of uh, 2022. And to this point, uh, they have uh, completely stopped with the wheelchair and stretcher car transport services. Um, that initially had some uh, issues with congestion in the hospitals, longer wait times for us to offload patients as a part of those stretcher car and wheelchair services are taking patients out of local hospitals back to their nursing homes or to their houses, uh, which free up bed space in the hospital. And so there's there's a little bit of what they call a through, throughput problem from the ER through discharge and then back out of the facility um, that causes some issues for us. Longer wait times for our ambulances, uh, longer wait times for area residents in their uh, uh, seeking medical attention at the, at the ER. And then um, oftentimes you can see where 911 uh, system resources are misused for return transports, meaning they're taking advanced life support ambulances or basic life support ambulances off the street to perform this work. We were fortunately able to kind of get in front of that with some education for dispatchers uh, and facilities that that's not what the 911 system resources are for. Uh, but it's, we've definitely felt the impact uh, as they started to leave the area. So as we look at our non-emergency contract uh, options or how we might deal with this uh, departure, um, the first was exploring the possibility of a new RFP process. Um, exploration uh, revealed that the, the work uh, would be challenging to find a contractor willing to do it in our area. A couple things that were drivers from that, according to um, AMR in Portland, which is American Medical Response, one of the largest privately held uh, ambulance providers, uh, basically said that the non-emergency service work, if you don't hold the entire system, um, it doesn't really pencil out in the way um, that they need it to. And so you're not going to see many coming to bid the work. Um, in particular, AMR has looked at our RFPs in the past and decided that this wasn't a big enough market for them. Um, the other provider in the state is uh, operates as Falk Ambulance. They're an international ambulance provider. Uh, they've actually gotten out of this business altogether, any of the contracts that they held for just non-emergency transport work. Um, and so what that told us was um, it might be a waste of staff time um, if we spend a lot of time trying to go out for an RFP and don't get any bidders. Um, while at the same time, we needed to make sure um, that we were prepared to bring this work in house if for some reason the private contractor, Mid Valley, chose uh, to stop providing service in our area really at any point in time. Um, so that was the other piece of the work that we've been doing um, is recognizing that the work on the system redesign um, that we're doing for ambulance transport has prepared uh, ESF to assume. Uh, this workload and the positions necessary to complete the mission, all within that, that kind of suite of new positions that we've created. Um, there's a potential for added transport capacity accessible by the 911 system, which we already utilize uh, Mid-Valley Ambulance when we're out of ambulances in the Eugene Springfield area uh, to back up our units in the 911 system. Um, and then the initial uh, forecasting uh, suggests that there's a potential for costs uh, recovery that will help stabilize our, our ambulance transport funds, at least this work, if not um, some additional services. So before we continue kind of what we're looking at in our recommendation, um, as I mentioned before, our EMS redesign goals uh, that I talked about, um, we'll have another work session in, in 2023 to really uh, explore and talk to you about uh, our goals there. But um, what we're doing is reclassifying how we staff our ambulances and what types of positions um, that we're utilizing, um, seeking single role ambulance only staffing uh, for a number of our, our transport units within the 911 system with a goal to address our critical system capacity, increase unit reliability, uh, provide 24 hour transport system supervision. Um, and so that's both for our units on the street, but also the interaction and uh, patient flow within the hospitals stabilize our basic life support staffing, um, and creating an EMS-only career path within opportunities for a new workforce, uh, which is important for us that instead of just adding a, a specific type of resource that can't go anywhere, that we bring um, community members into the organization and they have a career path all the way up to the top of the organization if they so choose without necessarily becoming fire. Leonard. 
Um, should I wait until the end of the presentation? Uh, how far are we? We're about halfway through. It, it would probably help. I might answer some of your questions as we finish through. Okay. And just leave your hand up. We'll get to you. Keep going. Mark. Okay. Sounds good. So the next next page is just to talk a little bit about our, our system capacity. Um, advanced life support units were frequently out or low on units. They're frequently being dispatched to deal with basic life support calls. Um, there's reliability concerns as a part of our uh, using them as part of our NFPA response standards, and then also limited ability for them to train in both fire and EMS disciplines while they're on duty. Our basic life support ambulances, uh, their unit hour utilization exceeds acceptable standards. We've seen that with initial investments on the Eugene side in our redesign work. Um, that the utilization is starting to drop into acceptable or industry standards. Um, staffing has been unreliable. We've used some savings in the redesign work to increase the wages for that workforce. Um, but they're still frequently out of service just due to uh, workforce availability as they're going to school. Um, we've addressed a substandard compensation package. Um, but they also still continue to require ALS support on all their calls. I mean, a paramedic assesses our community members when they when they call for help and then makes an appropriate transport determination. The next side. Um, so that's this is our current demand within ESF. And then um, this is the non-emergency demand. Sorry, the, the charts that we use are, are tipped differently. Um, but what you'll see is both systems uh, seem to peak um, at predictable times, meaning as we add capacity, uh, we're targeting the same hours. Uh, and that's where the the big part of our, our work is, is making sure that as we add resources, we're adding them when they're needed and not when they're not. Um, yeah. So this is just a quick snapshot of the FY22 call volume in the non-emergency transport work. It's another almost 7,000 calls um, in uh, 2022 ESF fielded nearly 48,000 calls for service. So. Um, it's not a insignificant number of calls that will be coming into our system. So our recommendation at this point is to utilize the City of Eugene's Ambulance Transport Fund to assume the responsibility of the non-emergency transport work. So think of it like um, they're the new contractor taking on this body of work as it relates to the calls that are generated in the City of Springfield. Uh, City of Eugene has the job classifications necessary, including BLS tech, single role EMT, and single role paramedics to service um, this work. And the non-emergency transport revenue in one uh, ATF for greater efficiency and workforce continuity, uh, allowing us to hire recruit and, and kind of contain that, that workforce, that body of work. The uh, chart here you see is just a kind of a representation of um, despite the community sizes, uh, the calls for service are generated almost equally between Eugene and Springfield. A lot of that has to do with the fact that transports between University District and or Riverbend Hospital are the top two sources of uh, non-emergency transport work. And so um, they're balanced pretty well. Financial considerations for this. Um, revenue, hit, revenue history from Mid Valley Ambulance shows that under our deployment plan, the service will operate in a revenue positive position. Um, it's not a significant number, but uh, we're able to add those unit hours uh, into our existing system, the necessary billing and uh, supervision, business management um, to help, help navigate that, that body of work. Ground emergency medical transport funding will help supplement a portion of the service delivery that's not available to the private ambulances. Um, and so that's a, that's a place where we see that revenue uh, for doing this work swing in our favor. And then revenue in excess of expenditures can be used to stabilize the ATF uh, funds in both cities uh, or help fund future EMS initiatives without reliance on general fund support. So the transition pro process, um, as we see it, we would negotiate a, a transition timeline um, in speaking with uh, purchasing our ability to modify the contract to recognize uh, contracting with their workforce for a period of time until we can bring 
uh, those staff and their units uh, under the ESF umbrella, completing the necessary uh, background and, and psychological requirements that uh, we expect for our, our public safety providers. Uh, we negotiate a uh, lease purchase of five fully equipped ambulances into the fleet. So the two things we need to accomplish this are a fleet and personnel. Uh, purchasing ambulances on our own right now would take well over a year for us to, to receive those units if we were to uh, go a different path. Um, the contracting of the personnel services, again, that will that will help us with a smooth transition. Um, not only are we concerned about addressing the work for our community, but also this workforce that they um, see a more stable transition from one employer um, to our employment. Uh, identifying bridge funding, the city of Eugene is, is working on uh, fund availability for us. Um, as you may or may not know, it takes 90 to 120 days from when we provide service for the revenue or the bills um, to start rolling in. Um, so we recognize that we need to be able to operate uh, for a period of time with that. And then initial ongoing uh, contracting billing support. We recognize that our billing staff, um, they have a lot of work to catch up with in their own shop. And so bringing another 7,000 calls on, uh, this will give us an opportunity to to hopefully push that out, move that body of work to a um, billing contractor to help us uh, make sure we're capturing the most revenue possible for this work. And then lastly, um, just thinking about the future of EMS, and we'll touch on this more in a future work session, but um, it's an ever-changing healthcare system with a lot of dynamic needs. Um, we're a critical safety net for our communities and the service we provide. Um, our redesign will position ESF to grow with changing demands, diversifying our services and the workforce that provides them, deploying the right resources to the right calls, um, providing living wage career positions at every level with opportunities for growth and creating capacity to plan for and anticipate future needs within the communities we serve. Leonard? <laughs> Oh, we no. have lost Leonard. Corey? Okay. Um, I have a few questions, and it may just be that I'm not tracking, or they may just be my typical messy questions. Um, so uh, in the part where you're talking about um, the sort of the redesign, um, where is it? The recommendation. Okay. Nine of 12. So it sounds like this is going to be paid for up front out of the sort of the Eugene's ambulance transport fund is going to the upfront costs. Um, <clears throat> does that mean that? How does that work with the sort of the employees and how it's going to be set up? Because I know now we try to split it between Eugene and Springfield as kind of like either or, you know, and knowing that these folks are working together as a team. And so how is, how is that going to, like, are they all going to be under, like, Eugene as employees, or is it just going to sort of perpetuate the, like, three people here and four people there? That's a great question. Um, and that's a part of why our recommendation comes forward that we keep this book of business together under one of the ATFs, meaning that those employees would work for the city of Eugene and their fund 592, uh, which is their, their ambulance transport. Uh, both for employee continuity, our ability to schedule and plan operationally. Um, the BLS program is the same way as despite that's a 911 street level resource within the city of Springfield that the revenue it generates comes into the Springfield Transport Fund. Uh, but those employees, they work for the city of Eugene because the city of Eugene has the BLS uh, classifications. Um, the ambulance redesign as we move into that phase. Um, that's a broader conversation that we've been having with staff of recognizing as we create a new workforce, depending on what happens with governance, if, if we don't change any of that, we move forward, there's a recognition that um, there's a body of that work that belongs in Springfield and, and people having the ability to come into that new classification, that new position within the current model. Yeah, that, I, it makes sense. And also like it makes me think about the future version of it. And then the second piece of that would be like, how then would Springfield pay for its part of it? You know, if Eugene is taking, if the funding is, the upfront funding is coming out of Eugene, is it going to be like a, like a bill back to Springfield or just, is it all going to be over at Eugene? And, but how do, how do we know what it costs to pay for our part of it? So 
and that that's the important part of looking at this as a book of business. You know, the non-emergency transport is even more of an enterprise, I would argue, than the 911 service, right? 911 service, there's a, there's a lot of, you know, how do you determine your essential services and, and fund those? This work, and as we moved into this work, is a recognition that um, if it doesn't make sense and it puts stress on our current funds in either city, um, it's not something that we should do. Here we recognize we have a legal responsibility to do it, and the forecasting suggests that we will be able to recover the cost for doing so. Um, and so that there is no liability for Springfield in this. It's almost like thinking that Mid Valley stepped away. There's a new contractor in town. It just happens to be the city of Eugene. That's a simple way to boil down how this might work. Joe. Thank you for the presentation. Appreciate it. So and I think I we spoke a little bit about this earlier. Um, so I wanted to get more clear in my head. So you're going to have uh, dedicated staff, new staff that are going to be dedicated to providing medical services. That's my understanding, which makes great sense. Um, and the other part is that where we have firefighters that are uh, dual certified as paramedics and firefighters, is that correct? Yes. And so the ones that are dual certified, and let's say you take on more firefighters, when you have your new firefighters, are you going to go through the expense and pay them more than what the basic firefighter gets by dual certifying all new firefighters? Uh, I think this this opens up for a bigger conversation through the the uh, EMS redesign work, but also recognizing um, our planning work going forward and saying if if we have a dedicated workforce that's providing this work, we still have a responsibility. First response EMS. Um, we have a busy system. We saw somebody um, recently experiencing a, a heart attack, um, waiting too long, in our opinion, for an ambulance to show up, but they had a a fire crew with them with certified paramedics to, to help provide that. To answer your question, you know, do we think that we continue to you know, need to have 250 paramedics um, on the fire department? I think the answer is probably not. Um, that also, in doing so, it's not you're just a matter of, of cost savings. It's, it's recruiting. Um, paramedics are getting harder and harder to come by as well. Um, and so uh, we will continue. You know, I think our communities... Uh, and, and our workforce um, takes great pride in the fact that we provide advanced life support first response through our suppression assets. Um, and so there will always be dual certified personnel. Um, but I think where you're headed with that is, um, yeah, there probably won't necessarily be as many um, on the suppression side in the future um, as we move through this planning. Because it does seem that that would be quite a savings, not having to pay people premium dollars to be multiple certification to have multiple certifications um but it would make sense too i mean i, I, I it just looks like it would be kind of a uh, scheduling nightmare in regards to make trying to make sure like in your example you had a firefighter that had was able to provide uh, advanced life support for somebody who's suffering a, a heart event um so again your argument by saying, okay, let's make sure we have some of those people available at every call. And then you have to look at, okay, well, how are we gonna do that if we have only some firefighters are not certified to that level and some that are? So are you gonna create a new classification to be able to schedule potentially? No, so we've operated with EMTs, EMT intermediates, um, in particular within the city of Eugene for a long period of time. Um, Springfield's only hired uh, back when it was Springfield Fire and Life Safety, uh, all paramedics, just because of the number of, of suppression assets versus the number of ambulances that they had to staff, um, you know, becomes more problematic. In a larger, more regional agency like we've become, um, you know, there's that economy of scale and the, the number of staff available to do that work. And so um, we're, we're used to scheduling around having folks that aren't necessarily paramedics to make sure that each rig has advanced life support. Um, and there are a number, I mean, pretty much every peer agency, um, to Springfield or Eugene Springfield Fire uh, within the state of Oregon provides uh, advanced life support via their first response. Thank you. Yep. 
where does the funding for this come from? So the bridge funding, um, well, even the cost of it in the long run, uh, we have the non-emergency ambulance service. Now, how are they funded? So it's fees for service. Okay. Um, there's a number of, of different ways. There's private pay, there's insurance, there's Medicare, Medicaid, there's the GEMT um, that comes through the Medicaid system uh, to help supplement operations. And then uh, there's another one, which, uh, you know, the, the term is the, you know, was it agency of last resort? Or payer of pay, last yeah, payer of last resort, sorry. Uh, meaning that if, if we really get in a bind and the hospital needs people cleared out, that we have contracts with them to move people out of the hospital if necessary. So we have property taxes to pay for fire and then a, a, a special levy here in Springfield for fire. And beyond that, for the for am, temporary ambulance service, that is paid for outside of that. Fee for service. So this is not a tax supported operation. Okay. Okay. Um, the well, thank you for the presentation. Uh, the one, I guess, the one question that I still have outstanding in my head is really getting a look at like what the both, uh, I guess, the the five year financial forecast associated to it is right because I know it, throughout the presentation it's really saying, hey, that we're going to be this is going to generate revenue. Um, it's got positive cash flow. The two questions I really have are around what's like confirmation that as a city, we don't have any capital outlay here, right? We're not, right. The, the startup cost is all borne by Eugene. And the second piece is understanding what the five-year outlook is going to be associated to this, right? Because if it makes money in the first year, right? And then it's driving liability in the out years, right? Like we still may have to do it, but I want to kind of understand, you know, is this bigger than a bread box? Yeah, and I, I think that's a, a great question. And for anybody, and, and Nate can probably um, back me up on this, is trying to forecast the ambulance transport system, you know, beyond just a couple of years and what's going to happen um, is sometimes difficult. Unfortunately, in uh, 2023, we're going to see a rate increase of 8.7% for Medicare and Medicaid uh, services, which help keep up with the cost increases that we're seeing. Um, but this, again, this body of work is a little easier to control. And at the end of the day, if we find ourselves in a position where it's not put penciling out or it's creating potential liability in the out years, we can always go for an RFP. We can always test the market. Um, I think, you know, it's, we're always asked to consider um, what does the whole system look like and where the liabilities are associated with that. Um, still pencils out in our favor. And in particular, I think if we look at what the community's expectation is um, for our services or even how Lane County code calls out our responsibility in it, um, that we never necessarily get out from underneath it and there's not a financial benefit to do so. Um, yeah. And I, and, and I understand that we may, we're, we're probably making the right sort of financial decision. I think it's my desire to see the sort of financial forecast to understand what is our actual risk in the out years, right? Because it could, you know, it could be low risk. We don't know that, right? Like it's not about, I think, understanding that the forecast is going to, you know, sort of be a precision level operation that will land us on a, a certain rock on the moon. But knowing that, you know, when when you look at, when you look at out those for, yeah, down the road, what actually is, is the risk? Um, now, I guess the second question that I had about it is, is there going to be a supplement to the memorandum of understanding between Eugene and, and Springfield about this? Like what, what codifies this is the contract arrangement? So the best way to address that is how we modify the contracts with the cities, which are referred to kind of in that transition process mm -hmm. is um, from here, if, if what we're getting from, from council is like, we're, we're okay with kind of continuing down this path assuming it in ESF, keeping the book of business under the city of Eugene, at least um, for the time being, uh, we would then work with legal um, and purchasing in both cities to make sure that the way we talk about how we acquire those ambulances, how we acquire that workforce, um, that it's well spelled out, that everybody's protected in that, and um, that it also identifies in what's the, what's the relationship. For us, in the way that our... Um, RFP or not RFP, but our IGA is is currently written. 
Um, it allows us the latitude around how we're, we're staffing and deploying resources. Um, it's about kind of where that revenue lands, right? And so I don't necessarily think that it requires a modification of our agreement um, to do this because we're not asking one city to pay another city's cost, not carrying the freight, not, not sharing the employees, rather keeping the book of business together. The one question I think we need to answer is how we acknowledge the, um, what happens if there's a significant surplus related to this body of work when you look at it, if it's evenly distributed between the cities, um, once our inner fund loan is paid back in the city of Eugene, um, then what happens if, you know, let's say we're a million dollars cash positive, well, what's going to happen? But You've got to answer both questions, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And that's, and I think that's like, I'm comfortable with, with going forward here, but I think you've got to answer both questions. What happens when it's positive and what happens with it when, it, when, it, if it's negative, right? Absolutely. Yeah. The, the only other question that I had, and then I'll let uh, turn it over to Council Rodley again. And this may be for the 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 spring question. When I look at that call demand sheet, right? Like I, you know, if we could, if we continue to throw capacity at the system, right, we're just going to sort of soak up, you know, that that overall capacity. So I guess my question is. Is there work being done to short really understand why why those peaks and why those valleys are there? And you know, if we have the ability as a as an entity to move some of that work off those peaks to sort of peanut butter spread it a little bit more. Yeah. That, that's a fantastic question. Um, and it's one that, that we continue to evaluate and tackle. Uh, you know, one, our first priority is is making sure that we're protecting the community the best way we can and, and making sure we have the resources to do the work. Um, but we've kind of continuously got an eye on how to address the calls that don't belong in the 911 system. Um, City of Eugene is utilizing an alternative response study that will help inform what's going on for all of ESF, not just um, the Eugene piece of our business, um, but what's driving the calls, what are the uh, other alternative options, you know, community paramedic work, 911 prevention, um, Chief Heppel uh, had a meeting last week where he, you know, he shared um, kind of a new fee for like FireMed Plus um, that allows some community paramedic evaluation. It's a, a greater cost. It covers those uh, those charges, but it also it helps prevent these these peaks and valleys. I mean, the peaks are going to be there, right? When people are up and moving around, they're sick, want to go to the hospital, etc. Um, our goal is to make sure that our our primary body of work is emergency response. And that's the type of work that we're investing in the most. And that the associated non-emergency work, whether it's non-emergency transports, whatever, um, that we have a, a solid plan for that. But right. yeah. Yeah. And I and I think that's and I think that's the the underlying sort of broader question, right? There's part of that work that is just random happen, happenstance, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's part of that work that either through planning contracts, right? Contact with people who shouldn't be calling 911 that maybe you can drive out of the system through a different intervention. Yep. And the the peaks, one of the things I mentioned, and, and again, you know, not to uh, keep hitting on the ability to present the uh, redesign in a later work session, um, part of that is is splitting up um, one of our ALS 24-hour ambulances into two peak hour ambulances. So, right, when you have that same capacity throughout that, we've we've addressed that a little bit with BLS. Now we're looking to address that in ALS so that we're, we're putting our investments where they're needed most and limiting our investments when there's just not enough uh, work to generate the cost recovery necessary. You're hyping this work session quite a bit that it's upcoming. <laughs> I, we're, I, we are proud and excited that, I mean, we took a huge step in creating a new workforce, a new job classification. Um, we just finished our first interviews and had a fantastic set of well-experienced paramedics looking to be paramedics. Our paramedic schools are, were telling us 50% of their enrollment don't want to be firefighters. Um, is incumbent mm -hmm. upon us to position our organization to be ready for that and to provide a medical only career path um for folks so we're looking forward to it yeah well i appreciate you guys both being strategic and flexible with that Councilor rodley all of your questions kind of led up to my last question which is probably really a nathan bell question i'm just curious if this is going to look different in our budget moving forward um 
or just if that's a place where we can be reminded to be paying attention for what you're talking about in terms of that five-year forecast. So I'm just wondering, is it going to look different? Is it going to, we'll forget that we, okay. More this is the play, we talked about the potential surplus or deficit, how that's happened, and then that'll factor in. That's us people online aren't going to be able to hear you right i was just going to say uh i can answer this quickly on a microphone on the record if you want to invite that would be fine. our finance director up that's fine as well um as uh nathan was mentioning in the short term not much but it is um, one of the things that we look at as um, an indicator in our general fund projections over a, a long period is uh, the ambulance fund itself, and that um, if we can reduce the general fund amount to the annual uh, to the ambulance fund, then that helps us um, in our outlook in the outer years. So it's definitely something that we'll be tracking. Uh, we will be addressing this in our budget process to talk about, you know, if we go this direction, talk about how we're going to redesign this the service because it's an important message about responsiveness um, to the community. All right, uh, Steve. When you take the fire department annual report, which I've done a few times, and, and look at fire calls and, and ambulance calls, quite a quite a difference in balance, but it still divides in, into the total budget. And is this going to be completely separate from that separate entity? It'll still be reported out in in our book of work. We've um, as we move through it, our intent bringing it on is we'll keep it together with the same monikers for the units so that we're able to track that, that it, this doesn't get just blended out and lost into to what we're doing. Because it's important to track statistics. They're, they're important to us. Because um, like you said, the, the medical side of this is the fastest growing part of our work. Um, fires stay consistent. They're getting more dangerous. Um, and you know the, the key there, the key measurement for us is our ability to get to them in a reasonable amount of time. Um, so. Yeah. I'm, I'm concerned about the taxpayers and what we're paying, what's going to cost us in, in future as it increases, it uh, can, can be a problem. Yeah, our goal is to make sure this work doesn't necessarily impact the taxpayers in that fashion. Yeah. As to That's sort of what I wanted to hear. All right, any other questions? All right, so thanks, Chief. Thank you. I appreciate the update. Appreciate your time and questions. Um, this was the only item we had for work session. So we are going to adjourn till seven o'clock and then we will be back on this link. So the work session's adjourned. Councillor, if you can hear, Councillor, if you can hear me, we're um, adjourned and we're going to be coming back at seven. Right, um, oh. Councillor, if you can hear me, we've just adjourned and we're going to come back at seven. Ceiling. Okay. Very good. Thank you. I'll I'll try not to crap out again. Okay.
Right now we just got we just got to wait in for one more minute. Why is my chair moving? Here, I'll hold it. It's a wiggly chair. Here, we'll hold it for you. It's very wiggly. All right. See what happens when you come early. All right, you want to start the? Oh, I guess the recording's going. All right, hit it. Really loud. All right, I'm going to call the Springfield City Council meeting to order with roll call. Mayor Van Gordon here. Councilor Pitts here. Councilor Moe here. Councilor Rodley here. Councilor Stair, Councilor Woodrow, and Councilor Pichonary here. I'm going to want to stay here. Uh, stay right here. All right. Oh. Councilor Woodrow is excused for the evening. All right. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, first item, please. Yes. <laughs> Mayor, the first item is Springfield Upbeat. Item number one is Mayor's Recognition, the 2021 Distinctively Springfield Teacher of the Year. And Mayor, this is your item. Come back and sit with mommy. Oh, don't worry. We'll be right down. All right. I'm coming down there and then we'll read the citation. You've got to come up here. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll get rid of this right. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> Don't worry, we will take we will take pictures with a number. No, it it is going live to the whole city right now, but luckily there's only like thirteen people. <laughs> All right. Thank you for coming. So earlier this year, I recognized several individuals in our community who contributed to making Springfield distinctive. There's one award left to hand out, and that was because you were teaching at the time and doing important stuff and couldn't make it. But I am so pleased to recognize uh, Springfield Public School teacher Pauline Pham. Pauline is a teacher at Springfield High School for English and Special Education. Todd Hamilton who is the school superintendent, describes Pauline as a shining example of the dedication uh, to Springfield school students and a teacher that is focused on improving the entire educational system to allow for student success. Pauline is part of the excellence in our public school system. She and her peers have been working hard to help students through this pandemic as they transition back to the classroom. And I, we all know it's been a lot of work. Your dedication is exemplary, and I'm really happy to finally recognize you as the 2021 Distinctively Springfield Teacher of the Year. And your daughter is a great stand-in mayor. Is <laughs> So you don't have to say anything, but no, don't let them peer pressure you into anything. But if you did want to share some of the people that have joined you, because I know you brought a lot of your family here, um, we would definitely, we would definitely appreciate if you introduce some of the folks you brought along. <laughs> so you didn't tell me that this was part of the assignment. <laughs> so um, I think the important thing to note is that. Um, Teachers are only as good as the team that is standing next to them, supporting them, collaborating with them. Um, so I'd really like to give a shout out to the special ed department here at Springfield High School. Um, it is the best department that I've seen. Um, 
we fight for our students, we advocate for equity, we fight for inclusion. Um, I'd like to thank the English department, who is also here. Wow. Um, they've given me the greatest co-teaching experience that I've had in my 15 years of teaching. Um, I'd like to thank my administrators that are present here, um, who have supported me um, in my journey in Springfield um, and really made me feel acclimated and welcome and um, a part of the Miller family. Um, and there's Brian, my director of special education, who has really helped me push forward a lot of inclusive um, protocols, programs at Springfield. This is part where I accidentally cussed. No. <laughs> um, and my daughter and my in-laws, um, they've been here with me the whole time too. Um, and um, thank you for allowing us to be here. All right. Now we have now we're we got to take we got to stand here we got to take a picture and then we're going to try to take a selfie with all these folks here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the background. All right. All right, squeeze in, people. Time. Selfie time. Who thinks we're selfie taker? You guys got a All right. The layer. The layer. Get in here, Tim. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> One more round of applause. Some of the are required to stay for. <laughs> and most importantly, you cannot forget to take this. Oh. Uh, you, uh, school district is dismissed now if you want to if you want to stay around because um yeah <laughs> you're more than welcome to thank you guys so much for coming thank you Uh, for the ministers, you do know I was kidding, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, next item, please. Uh, next item is the second Springfield Upbeat, and this is recognition from David Willis. I was going to joke that this is a, a a sub idea of giving everybody shovels so you can help us with uh, the <laughs> lower our cost, but uh, not tonight. So David Willis, uh, two two seven six thirty six Court. Um, tonight I'm representing the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, and um, I'm a I was a volunteer member of the groundbreaking committee for the Willamette Valley Temple, and uh, the reason I'm here tonight is I really wanted to thank. The city of Springfield for your work. Uh, it was um, amazingly smooth. Uh, the comments that we received from the uh, real estate team were very complimentary. And uh, Christina Kratz's name continually came up. So I want to really thank her for the work that she did. Uh, Steve Moe was able to attend. We weren't able to invite everybody to the, the groundbreaking as the um, it was limited as to who could come. However, we will be having an open house when the building is completed and people of all ages, um, backgrounds, beliefs, mm -hmm. beliefs are going to be welcome to come. So we're looking forward to that and we'll certainly be in communication with you. Um, this is a really important building for the, the members of the church. There are very sacred covenants that are 
um, taken there. And certainly it's our hope that uh, as members, we become better people and also better citizens. So and gratitude, sincere gratitude for the work that the city did and what you did. We would like to uh, share this shovel with you and recognize Steve for being there as he represented uh, the mayor and the city council. We're not moving any dirt. <laughs> Thank you. All right, next item, please. Mayor, the next item is consent calendar. I make a motion that we approve the consent calendar. Second. Neil, could you call the vote, please? Yes, Councillor Pitts. Aye. Councillor Moe. Yes. Councillor Rodley. Yes. Councillor Stair. Councillor. Aye. Councillor Woodrow. And Councillor Pichonary. Aye. Motion passes, five yeses, zero noes, one absent. Next item, please. Uh, next item is business from the audience. Oh, I didn't. We, I got, we got so excited, I didn't even read the script. All right. I'm going to read the script first and give people a chance. As we have got to the midpoint of our meeting tonight, I'd like to ask the members on, of the audience who are joining us by phone or online to keep yourselves on mute. There is one time designated for public testimony and that's business from the audience. That's the item we are on now. If you're attending in person, please complete the request to the speaker card located at the entrance of the council chamber and give it to the city recorder. If you're joining us online with a tablet or smartphone, please raise your hand. The order of public testimony is as follows. Anyone from the council chambers? or than anyone who's raised their hand virtually. And I have no cards tonight. And Mayor, it appears we have no hands for this item. Next item, please. Uh, next item is business from the city manager. You have two items under this. Uh, item number one, use of recreational vehicles, RVs as temporary housing with registration. This is resolution three, modifying resolution 2020-34 to allow recreational vehicles as temporary housing with registration. Katie Carroll is here for the staff report. Neil, I think we missed business from the council. Oh, I apologize. I don't read the script one time and we're all discombobulated. Any business from the council? Is there any business from the council? Um, the only announcement that I had was that we are, I'm really close for next year's committee assignments. Uh, the staff's just checking council, uh, like staff contacts, dates of meetings, things like that. I'm going to distribute that by email before we bring it back on the first meeting of the year. And that would give you a chance to hopefully look at it, make sure the dates still work for you, that it's an interest area, and then give me any feedback about it uh, ahead of time. Anybody else? All right, next item. Um, next item is um, business from the city manager. And Mary Bridget, should I read this back into the record? Or are we good to go? Why don't you read it back? Okay, you got it. Uh, we have two items under business from the city manager. This is item number one, use of recreational vehicles, RVs as temporary housing with registration. Resolution number three, modifying resolution 2020-34 to allow recreational vehicles as temporary housing with registration. And now Katie Carroll is here for the staff report. All right. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Great. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Katie Carroll. I'm the city's housing analyst. Um, so this resolution that I have for you tonight is would amend the city's existing temporary RV occupancy guidelines to require that property owners who are hosting RVs register with the city at no cost. The city has had a resolution in place since October 2020 that temporarily suspends enforcement of codes that would otherwise prohibit RV occupancy. And so what that allows for is for RVs to be used as temporary housing when they're parked on private property and RV occupants and property owners follow the city's guidelines. 
Um, and again, as a reminder, this doesn't apply to RVs in manufactured home parks, RV parks, um, campgrounds, or the overnight parking program, um, or in the right of way. And so in September, council directed staff to um, begin requiring registration as part of this program so the city could get an idea of um, to what extent this is being used as it figures out how it wants to move forward. And so what this resolution does is basically just add an additional requirement onto those um, occupancy guidelines that property owners register with the city at no cost. Um, and then in that registration, we would ask the property owner for contact information for the RV occupant so we could send them a separate anonymous survey and ask those questions um, that council had directed us to ask at the last meeting. So um, whether folks were displaced by the holiday farm fire, um, whether they're paying rent, and whether they have access to water and electricity. Um, so that's kind of what this resolution does. In addition to that, seeking feedback from council tonight on when it would like to check in on this item next. Uh, previously, council had directed staff to report back um, in the spring next year, but it might be beneficial to delay that to allow some more registrations to come in. So um, interested in hearing if council still wants to check in in the spring or put that off for a little bit. And that's everything. I have questions. I can take questions now. Joe. Thank you, uh, Sean. Thank you, Kate. So uh, I, I'm okay with delaying it just a little bit so you have time to gather your information. I am, uh, you piqued my interest when you're talking about if we're asking those folks if they're paying rent. And so if they respond, yes, that is contrary to the provisions. And so what is your step when it comes to, what is your next steps when someone says, oh yeah, I pay rent, what are you gonna do? So since this is a complaint driven system that wouldn't prompt us to take any action, um, in the questionnaire, we've let folks know, hey, these are the guidelines. Um, so if someone were to then go look at them and see that they're not allowed to charge rent, then they could call the city. Um, about that, but it's not like a proactive step that we would do. It's more an information gathering. And I think the other um, sort of important piece to point out with that is making the survey anonymous might also help with um, getting more feedback from folks. Yeah, and I get that. But on the information page that you put out, and I, and I may have missed it, um, and I, unfortunately, I'm in a position where I can't look at the paperwork and, and attend this meeting at the same time. So I didn't, I don't recall if in that information you provide that it said anywhere within those, within that pamphlet information that rents cannot be charged specific, specifically. Is it are you, there? Are you talking about the guidelines? Oh, I yeah. guess you can't see them. Can't see um, them. <laughs> I'm pretty sure, but let me just double check. Let's see. Yep. It says property owners may not charge rent, but may ask the RV occupants to contribute towards utilities. Okay. So I'm, I'm looking at, I'm thinking about that and I'm thinking about property owners saying, you know what, you can contribute 500 a month towards utilities. So does that seem appropriate or is, is there some other way in which we can make sure that folks that are on those properties aren't, uh, aren't being actually charged rent where the property owners are alluding to utilities, but using that as a scapegoat. Um, so you're talking about like charging excessive Yeah, with something, utility with, amount. With something actually, not necessarily excessive, but charging more than what it, they are, more than what it's costing them in utilities to be there. Anything above that amount is excessive. I'm not sure if Sandy's on the line to um, provide any further input. I guess my thought initially is just since it is a complaint driven system, um, oh, there Sandy. comes Sandy. Yep. Yep. Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. Um, Sandy Belson, Comprehensive Planning Manager. So, I mean, to continue on what Katie was saying is um, if we did get a complaint that there was excessive um, charge for the utilities, we would have our code enforcement officers look into that and determine whether that was happening. And if so, make sure that they knew what the guidelines were. Um, and 
if there was continued problems, we would just continue down the regular code enforcement um, path, which could mean that the RV owner would have to leave. Well, and so that goes back to my, my line of questions. If you were an RV owner, would you complain? Well, so, I, I guess the thing is that we're, if we're going to be, if we're going to advocate for people to have housing, then we turn around and say, well, this is complaint driven only. Do you honestly believe that anybody in RV is going to say a word about them being potentially charged rent? as opposed to the city asking those questions and saying, okay, we have an issue here and we're going to be proactive to protect those folks as opposed to kicking back and, and knowing full well that if you had an RV and you're on someone's private property and they're charging you three to $500 a month for utilities and you know they're not using that much utilities, but are you really going to say that? Because even in your own words, just a few seconds ago, you would have to move, they would kick you out. And so is that going to allow for, do we have a provision for the um, FED process for that? I mean, are they entitled to FED process? I do not believe that that would be applicable in this case, but it looks like Mary Bridget has something to offer. I would bet you, I would bet you to say that Mary Bridget is going to say, yes, they have a right to FED process because they have a legal residency. They, um, Councilor Pichonari, it's Mary Bridget here, they may have a right to um the FED process, but that's a, a legal operation between um, the landlord and the tenant in circuit court, and the city wouldn't be involved in um, or interfere with that process. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. I totally know that the city wouldn't be involved in that, but I'm looking at the, um, the ability for those folks that are in those RVs to have something that's going to support them. And as long as they know that there is some of that support out there, they'd be much more willing to support this this code, this quote unquote temporary code, if we're not being, you know, 360 on it, that's all. I, I do think one option could be that if that, let's say a complaint came through and it looked like the utilities were inflated, you know, the city staff would have to be careful that they're not giving legal advice, but they could certainly talk about resources that are out there for housing. And then that person could take action as they saw fit. So would there be, a, I guess, for you to, or for a question back to you, Mary B., is that is do we provide any do we provide any remedy within that code for the RV owners that are there because of fire or lack of housing? I don't think outside of the complaint process that we do. Okay, it's maybe something that council should consider. Okay, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Okay, so I think we've got. A motion we've got, we need, but we also need to provide some direction. So are we fine coming back? Let's see. I don't know if probably the re the fall. The resolution says in 2023. So um, that would allow for us to come back in the fall. Okay. Would, 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 fall give, would early fall give you enough time to collect uh, additional information from the survey? Yeah, I think that it, that would help at least in getting the word out. Um, yeah, I think that would be good. Okay, so I, I'm good with fall. The second question, and I think this is uh, to Councillor Pichonari's point, is when the survey goes out, is it gonna, going to prompt, right? I'm, when you write, I guess, when you write the survey, if is it going to say, hey, if you've got complaints or issues, or com here's a phone number for you, to, for you to call? It has my contact information if um, okay. anyone has questions, but I could slightly reword it to like if you have questions or concerns would yeah. that address what you're thinking yeah i think i i think that would i think that would help and then let's let's sort of punt the whole conversation uh about and just get an update on this on the complaint portion of it because i think that's valuable to sort of pull out that we kind of have created a regulatory process that it's maybe unclear about how it would be actually regulated or we deal with something um and when we when we come back in the fall can we talk about it then Joe. Thanks, Sean. Maybe a little addition to that to piggyback with that, Katie, is that if um, and, and your response was yes, we could we could uh, take a look at those complaints or whatever. But as opposed to, would you be within your department? Would that 
would you be a person that can receive a complaint and have that be initiated to for a response or are you just going to say noted no, I would pass that on to code enforcement if it was okay. a complaint. Super. I think it's um, more like I'm the source of if you have questions about what the guidelines okay. are, so I can pass those on if it's a complaint. Yeah. Fair enough. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, Steve. So as we've discussed, um, uh, resolution number three to allow RVs as temporary housing with registration to uh, approve it. Second. Could you call the vote, Neil? Yes, Councilor Pitts. Aye. Councilor Moe. Yes. Councilor Rodley. Yes. Councilor Stair. We lost Leonard again. Councilor Woodrow and Councilor Pichonary. Aye. Motion passes, four yeses, zero noes, two absent. Next item, please. Um, business from the city manager number two. This is to temporarily waive system development charges for affordable ho home ownership housing. Resolution number four, resolution temporarily waiving the city system development charges for newly permitted homes sold affordably to low income households. And Katie Carroll is here for the staff report. All right. Hi again. Um, so this resolution would implement a program to waive system development charges or SDCs for new housing that's sold affordably to income qualified households. Waiving SDCs reduces the upfront cost to development and can help developers um, provide housing units for sale at prices that are affordable to low income households. So council directed staff to create this program back in May and then in October September and October work sessions reviewed draft program guidelines and provided direction on um, the design of the program. So as a reminder, this would be for houses sold to households earning up to 80% of the area median income and would need to remain affordable for a period of five years. Um, staff has made a couple of minor wording changes to the program guidelines since you reviewed those um, in October. And um, those are noted in attachment two of your packet uh, in tracked changes. Kind of the biggest one of those was to add the language around capping the program. Um, so as a reminder, if this goes, if council votes this in, it will start January 1st of next year, run through the end of 2025. So three years or until the city has waived $300,000 um, for this program and uh, whichever one of those comes first. And that's um, what I have for that. Are there questions? Jill. Thank you, Sean. Um, two points on that documentation. I was able to read through all of it. Um, first is that it lists the SDC waivers and it lists the city SDCs. And then it also lists where it says wastewater. And that's the that's under the purview of the MWMC, and if I correct me if I'm wrong, and that the city doesn't have the authority to waive MWMC SDCs. Only the commission at the MWMC has that authority. Can you point me where um, you're seeing that? No, oh, because you can't because you don't have the. <laughs> um, it, it, it literally has a list. I think it was back. It was about two thirds through. And it gave a list of what the SDC, maybe Sandy, I see her. I see local wastewater. Is that what you were going to say, Sandy? Yeah. So there's local wastewater that the city does collect. Um, so the guidelines say that the city will waive transportation, stormwater, and local wastewater SDCs. And then it right. says uh, Metropolitan Wastewater Management Commission and William Lane Park and Recreation District SDCs are still in effect. Right, but what's the wastewater? Who do, does the city actually collect wastewater SDCs, or is are they not collecting SDCs for MWMC on the wastewater charges? Both of those. So we do collect some local, and then uh -huh. we also collect wastewater on behalf of MWMC. Right. So that's what I'm saying is, is that the. Um, so there's, so there's, you collect two different input wastewaters. Yes. Okay. So we're making sure that that's separated and that we're not trying to speak on behalf of MWMC. Yes. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So it's just the city imposed SDCs. 
And then, oh, thank you, I appreciate that, mm -hmm. clears that up. So the other part of the document that I had question in regards to um, the, ah, oh, shoot, it was the, um, oh, the AMI. Mm -hmm. so in the document, it says the Eugene Springfield AMI, the combination of the two, and does not the city of Springfield have its, I, I know it does, its own AMI of its citizens. So the it's the Eugene Springfield Metropolitan Statistical Area, um, and that's the AMI that we use for like the shop program and the home repair program is that one. And I'm not sure whether they report at the city level. I would have to check on that. And that would, that's just something I want to bring up because this is a Springfield, a Springfield project, Springfield um, decision. And if we, I don't want to, if possible, at least me, I don't want to involve Eugene statistics, which can skew Springfield statistics quite a bit, because I know that the average income of Springfield citizens are, is less than Eugene citizens, as well as the valuation of the homes. So I think if this is going to be a Springfield program for building homes, then we need to stick with Springfield numbers and not a combination or skewed numbers that, that Eugene would, would definitely do. And I'm not sure, Sandy, if you're there, do you know if they report? Uh, so this is a HUD generated figure. Right. So I'm just not sure if they report at the Springfield level or if it's just at the statistic so we have area. That, don't we? I don't think we get the numbers on a regular basis for Springfield and that Eugene Springfield Metropolitan Statistical Area is actually all of Lane County. So it's including the whole county um, in terms of the average of the numbers. And that's typically what we, I mean, as Katie said, it's the number that we use for all the different programs that we use. So if we use a different number, which we might be able to get something um, that's not updated as frequently just for Springfield, um, but then it would be out of date. So um, you can, I'm not sure how to respond at this point. I'm just saying as far as I think it would, I think it would allow for more participants in the program if we were using Springfield numbers and not have those numbers artificially inflated by having Eugene numbers on there. So I just thought I'd raise that. No, I, Joe, I think it's a, it's a, Intra, it's an interesting observation, but I don't think the economic the, the statistic exists at that level. And I think that's kind of what what everybody's the staff sort of describing. So if that statistic doesn't exist in a Springfield level, are you good or you want to talk about this a little bit? Well, like, I don't think it's a Eugene. If it doesn't rise, if it doesn't rise above interesting, then no, it's not worth the, the effort. Uh, you're right, but I don't think it exists is what, what, and I'm looking over at, at Nancy and she's nodding that like that number just doesn't exist. They don't collect data at that level. Okay. I thought Elcog has that, but all right. Nancy. And I would, I would just say based on my previous prior experience, uh, uh, supervising the, uh, census process in California, um, there is, you would probably, that level of aggregate data probably would be collected within the census, but that's only on a 10 year time horizon. So, you know, the last decennial census was 2020. And so you would, you would have the stale numbers for about a 10 year period of time. Um, I don't think there is a, now a yearly, um, more accurate uh, data set that we could use for that process. Okay, so when we do our when we do our um, levies, we use an average valuation of the homes, so we can call that out where we have Springfield valuation of homes, but we don't have the data for income for Springfield citizens. Correct? Is that what you're saying? On an annual basis, I think it's we it's an estimated. Um, what you do for levies is different than um, trying to do a, a community income estimate, and so. Right. Um, it's, it's two different data points. You can make a rough estimate on home valuations based on um, your property tax records throughout the county, but it's difficult to um, do that more with your individual income because that's personal reporting. And so it's more through um, the U.S. Census would be the, the okay. easiest way to capture that. All right. 
and then I think maybe just a, another little helpful piece of background is that um, the numbers that HUD reports, they're changed by different household sizes too. And I think they do some back end calculating um, that I think wouldn't be as simple for if we did have a number for us to then come up with the different household sizes. So there's kind of some background stuff that HUD's doing as well. Okay, any other questions? All right, Steve. I make a motion that we adopt resolution number three. Uh, it's Second. four. Hang on. Four and four. Correct the motion. Oh, yeah. It's very you, first line. you know, the way they write these down, I always get it screwed up. Anyway, I adopt resolution number four. Second. Neil, could you call the vote, please? Yes, Councillor Pitts. Aye. Councillor Moe. Yes. Councillor Rodley. Yes. Councillor Stair. Councillor Woodrow. And Councillor Pichonary. Yes. Motion passes, four yeses, zero noes, two absents. All right, thank you, everybody. Next item, please. Any other business from the city manager? No further business, thank you. Any business from the city attorney? No business, thanks. We are adjourned, thank you. <laughs>